when that is not there. And then, do they have to go in separate companies for water treatment, or just like with chillers, or do they, or we do it? No, um, water filtration, and, no, this here, you just install a in line water filter and monitor it. Uh, Oh, oh, those systems that you're, you're talking about right in Huntington with the water so Sweet bad? Water How come they don't have like a Culligan water company come in and, and like do a whole water treatment before it enters the building? Money. Because um, I might be able to find somebody for you though. Money. I mean, it's cheaper for just having you do it with the filter? Or? If you, if you, um, I think you have a more. But this, the ice makers normally have the dedicated person. They don't want you to put it on a building. No, no, I understand that. I'm just saying, like, do they, do, does that building have a water company that comes in to try and probably, especially for the boilers? Right. So. Now, uh, nobody's going to go in here and do all of this distillation and arrow and deionization in a, a little bit. And no restaurant owner has the capital to lay out that for that system. I mean, an arrow system is pretty um, expensive on its own. Distillation is expensive. Deionization is expensive. All of those are expensive. So. You, what's the process of deionizing? It's electrocute the water. Like electrolysis? <laughs> yeah, actually, that's what it is. You're saying that's what it is, electrolysis? Yeah. Um, you, you're treating it for electrolysis, so it wouldn't cause electrolysis. Yeah, all right. Because if you have treated water coming from a water treatment mm -hmm. plant like the tongue provides, mm -hmm. it will be ionized water mm -hmm. to some extent. Mm -hmm. And that has a negatively charged um, electron in there. So you need to, instead of that reacting to any metal to ground, you need to neutralize it. Okay. Uh, all right? Some sense? Some it's logical? Now, distillation, we don't need distillation because that's expensive. Our row systems. Arrow system, if you're not using it 24-7, you're no good. Because once you start them up, they need to run to see that water as the filters become foul up. Okay, so they need to produce exactly the required amount of water that you're using to be, um, to justify installing one of those. Yeah. Yeah, Chris. Reverse osmosis. Yeah, reverse osmosis. Huh. That just sounds expensive. Now, what is reverse osmosis exactly? Salt water. Osmosis is not really salt water. What is that? What? What else? It's for any, any water. Is you purify it by reverse osmosis. Wherein, you know, plants remove the solids from the water they pull up, right? Mm -hmm. And that the minerals and what have you, and that's what they make use of as their food, and they reject the water. In this case, we get rid of the solids and liquid, the solids, and we use the water. Okay. Reverse osmosis. The other thing, plants the other thing is take the minerals out and yes. get rid of the water. Yeah, plants use the minerals, we use the water, so we do the reverse of the plants. Okay. Okay. All right. And that's why it's called reverse. So that's why it's reverse. So. Um, you see, they're saying up here, seventy-five percent that's because these guys did a research throughout the country, and they probably do it in selected locales. But from my experience out here on Long Island, it's ninety-five percent, ninety to ninety-five percent problem. So, guys, once you live on Long Island, you're going to do service on Long Island, and we're going out more west. Think a higher percentage there, because as we go past. Um, Route 112 and head east, most of these people have their own dedicated well. They don't have um, potable water from the county. They're dependent on well water. Well water is not, I mean, it's pure, 
Yeah, but, but it's, it's got that, a lot more I mean, minerals. It has a lot of minerals and suspended whatever. That eats, you. Up, that eats up copper pipes and stuff. That, that yes, water. because out there they, they don't only use <laughs> copper pipe. They don't use copper pipe, they use the black one. <laughs> 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 Okay, ice breakers. For uh, 125, that's stressing it. But uh, you, you normally would not see this kind of temperature, you know, ice making this kind of location where you have 125 degrees. Uh, well, it's just telling you that it's capable of it. Yes, it is designed. To work at that, but if it's going to work at that, it's um, you're going to get endless problem. Number one, if I work in an ambient of 125 degrees, what would be my condenser saturation or CST? Well, it's going to condense at 20 degrees more than that. So. Let me do bet one better. Let me give you 15 degrees more. Instead of 20, use 15. So it'll be 125. 140. 140. 140. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And for most systems, um, 100 and 30 ish, 35 is critical point. On most of them. On a lot of systems, yes. Yeah. That's around critical yeah. point. So, um, because these are not, these are. Your head press is up there at that point. On a low point. Yeah. So these refrigerators. So if you got 135 psi. No, you love. I'm sure if you got a if your saturation is at like 135. Sat, that's your temperature. Yeah, then yeah, he said your saturation temperature. Yes, yeah. would be 135. So what would, what would what would your head pressure be? Well, you got to use. Well, it depends on what type of gas you use. I mean, you just go in the um. You go to pressure chart. Pressure temperature chart and thing, but you see. We, Here's the deal, guys, with any air conditioning or heating system. Forget you ever know anything about pressures, right? All we're dealing with is moving BTUs from here to there or from there to here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, BTUs equates to temperature. Always do your equations in temperature, and the last thing you do is translate it into pressure. So forget that we're dealing with pressures. I don't really care what type of gas this is. Okay. Bottom line is, Your if it's 134, if it's 22, if it's 404, the temperature is still 135. Yeah. All right? That's your condensing. Which is, that's a common factor there. Temperature. Temperature is our common factor. So we conserve with temperature. And at this, your machine will, instead of making a batch of rice in 20 minutes, it's probably going to take an hour and 20 minutes. They will, your machine just ex begin to exceed its safety limits, working safety limits. Because remember I told you, most of these machines, if ice, if it doesn't harvest ice within one hour, it goes into its own harvest and it, it does so for three um, cycles. <coughs> you can see the machine does it automatically, it shuts down. So right away we're in a shutdown mode. Because we're really, really, borderline exceeding safety limits. Likewise here, 40 degrees. Believe it or not, the, the bin, the ice bin, has a thermostat to control what the ice level is. That thermostat is set to cut out at 40 degrees. So it's gonna shut down your machine. And the reason um, these machines shut down at 40 degrees is because the compressor will not be, the oil cannot get hot enough to, to um, lubricate the compressor. Right, and it won't be hot enough to get adequate oil returned back to your compressor. All right, so 
a lot of factors now. So these two, you're outside the zone. I mean, you're borderline, but it only takes it only takes this little either way to um, go out of very close out the limits, you know. Um, You'd rather see it around. Yeah. If the whole unit is outdoor, you know, the, if it's a package unit and it's outdoor and outdoor temperature goes below 40, that machine ain't going to work, like I said. Um, if it's indoor and the condenser is outdoor, it will work, but it's going to have head pressure control. In this case, there's no way we can use a fan cycle control because I do not want a fan cycle control. I want constant head pressure. So to maintain constant head pressure, I use the LAC. And this LAC would be the LAC 210s for 404 and 22 gas. There is a... Um, it's open on the rise of... Yeah. On the rise of that. So, there are some of them designed for certain ice machine with pressure as high as 240. You have to make sure you're buying the right. Yes. Yeah. In a case like that, it's OEM, you're not going to get it from any supplier. You have to call the manufacturer and let get the part from there. <laughs> so, <laughs> see, most um, most machine now we stop using a mechanical float, but you will still find machines with mechanical floats out there because. There are some people who just love to hold on to old ice makers, I don't know why. It has no value. No resale value that is. It has no it has no emotional value. You know? no. Some people have tried to strengthen Yeah, and it's a money it's a money um money pit. Money pit for everybody because getting these parts now for these older machines. You actually have to go back to the manufacturer. There was one point where the manufacturer asked me if I'm a, if I'm a moron. Ah, because they, 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 a moron. Yes, because they threw away all the dice and the drawing and specifications for one of the machines I was calling them to get parts for. So uh -huh. I told the uh, business owner, hey, you know, you just stop making it, you might as well get a new machine. Uh -huh. so like I said, I don't know why people actually hold on to these old machines. Yeah. So um, one of the things that will happen if your supply water valve is leaking while it is making ice, <coughs> we have, remember we said this is batch. Most of the time, this is a batch making. <coughs> Whatever water is in that reservoir, that's what it's going to use. But if water keeps trickling in, the float is never going to go down to a level where it indicates that it's ready to harvest. So I'm going to have ice building up. Um, and this evaporator coil, and it's never going to go into a harvest because it has a constant supply of water coming in all the time. And those are for the machines that has the float sensor to activate the harvest cycle. Yeah, but it breaks and... So if it, it's leaking and keep the float up, so then the machine doesn't pass. sense that the bin is empty. I mean, <coughs> the reservoir is empty. It's going to say, hey, I still need to make some more ice before I have this, and there it goes. And it just so builds, just keep building. Yeah, and it just keeps filling, filling, filling all the time. Now, with the mechanical float, that's not a problem. With a mechanical float, there has to be something else. Actually, it could be a problem, and let me tell you why. Anyway. If you have one of those single wire, um, 
to the thickness control. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Right? That would put these machines in harvest. But if I have the reverse acting low pressure control, yeah. that suction pressure, because you're seeing warm water coming in all the time, that suction high. pressure will stay high, yeah, high and high. it's not going to activate that low pressure control. So it's not going to switch it over, so you have ice build up. So if you notice, all the problem I'm talking about so far water. is water related. And it's, you said they phased a lot of that out. Yes, they, they phased some of these out. But still, everything is water related in here. Bare, hardly electrical problem, hardly refrigerant problem. Because if the machine is self contained and it's not leaking, there should no problem. Even though some of the problem you will see here mimics a refrigerant problem, it's not a refrigerant problem. All right. So That's the last thing you want to do is put your gauges on one of these machines because they're critically charged, guys. The moment you put the gauges with six feet hoses on it, that's two six feet hose. At, um, at pressures over 200 PSI, you, you get in like most of the um, usable refrigerant out of the system. So every time you put, imagine every time you put that on to your system, it's 10% um, 10, 10 But can, or, you, can, you, can you put it back into the system before you take the gauges off? How can you, these systems are not equipped with pump dump. I can put it back if I had a system that's equipped with pump dump. Okay, but you're not. You, couldn't you, you know, close the loop and let, it, let the low side suck it back, suck in. It back in? in no, but I'm just saying, you do not have any valve you can valve off the high side you're to pump the system down. You can only take so much out of the hose, yeah. but not everything. Not everything. But that means you still have some percentage remaining in the hose. And if you go on that machine twice a year, you know, every time you do a clean and you attach your gauges, time by, you by the time two years done. So in other words, you just want to make sure that the, if the system's getting cold and freezing up and doing what it's supposed to, change yeah. it's good on gas. Yeah, and um, one of the best ways to do that, guys, is attach your thermometer. You have thermometers with pipe type clamp yeah, no, uh, and you just clamp it on. And if you get the temperatures that you know on your gauges, you read the pressures, right? Mm -hmm. And then you go to the PD chart to, to check your temperature because what? My water temperature coming into the evaporator coil will be uh, like 65, but my evaporator, the liquid refrigerant coming in there must be below freezing and the temperature below freezing. Maybe. So if I can measure that, and it's below freezing, let's say 10 degrees below freezing, which is where I probably wanted initially, then hey, if it's 10 degrees and that's where I want it, it means it has the right pressure. And you know the pressure. And get, yes, so you, know the you don't need to attach your um, manifold gate set. See, a lot of guys, um, I mean, a lot of the, let, let me put this a different way. I'm not beating up on anybody. But a lot of instructors who has this old-fashioned crap that the gauges, the manifold gauges are going to be a freaking technician. No. What I can do with a good thermometer will take you years to do with a manifold gauge set. I can charge a system. Of course, I need a hose. But I can charge it without the assistance of a manifold gauge set. And actually, I did that already because one time I was driving and the, the gate set yeah. fell off right. the highest yeah. part of the truck I hooked yeah. it on, and both gauges broke. But my hose didn't break. I have a thermometer and check here. You're, wait a while, this is not the temperature I need to get here. I need to see five degrees yeah. more. Hey, let's see if there's some more gas, five degrees coming on the high side. That's I'm home. Yeah. I'm good to go. Nobody can tell me that hey, that's wrong because I could dare them put the damn gauge as well. Mm -hmm. So when you go do all these things, you know, use what you have. But because, now, if you put the gauges on just to get the pressures and you keep them closed, you just get the pressure. You're not getting any. You're not getting. Yeah, but what he's saying is you're still feeding. You still, still have six feet of hose. 
Is there a size six yes, or seven the, yeah, you're so, right. the manifold is both. That could be an ounce and, and that could be what? An ounce and a half in each hole you said? Probably, because it's six feet is how many inches, twelve, six or seven to two inches, right? Yeah. Yeah. Five feet to six inches. So, so it's seventy two inches. inches long. It's a new lunch time. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I don't think, yeah, they won't pay attention. If I have a arm, um, 72 inches long, it's quarter inch internal diameter. Quarter inch? Yes. Do all the manifold gets at the hoses, they're quarter inch internal. Yeah. So if you find the area of that in square inches and multiply it by 72, it's going to give you volume, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And all you do is go to the tables, um, I don't know if it's at the back of that book. So what but it's going to give you a volume relationship to, how, much the to um, the how many ounces, ounces that is. Yeah. So here I have two, two, man, two arm holes, the high side holes, the low side holes, filled with refrigerant. 12 feet long, that is. And that's totally 12 feet. So that's refrigerant I took out of the ice maker. I mind you, I said it was a critical charge. Yeah. <coughs> so, Let's say that um, that he, that may translate into me losing one percent of the refrigerant charge. At that point in time, it, the, you're not going to see any kind of effect, you know, visually. It, it may not jump out at you, but if you do that, like four service calls just to clean the water circuit. But every time you clean, you put on the for no reason at all except that you want to impress the, the um, business owner. You can just hang them there. Yeah, <laughs> I prefer that. Yeah. Instead of sticking it on there, you know. So that's four percent or five percent of the um, charge it took out. Right away, you will begin to see the problem. The biggest problem is not that the ice maker would not make ice; it will but it's not going to harvest the ice properly. It's going to have an extended harvest period now, harvest time, because I do not have the volume of gas to, to build up gas. that temperature to get enough hot gas to harvest the yeah, ice yeah, properly. Yeah. So, so basically on, on, on any not. critically charged system, you'd rather check temperatures than pressures. Yes, mm -hmm. I would check temperatures all around before I stick a manifold gauge set on it. Yes, and sir, Mr. Charles. And the ice machine, when the ice machine stuck together, is a leak or does it have? The home ice machine? Yeah. You You're talking about the one in your little fridge? Yeah, you know when it stuck together, is it, is it a leak or is it like the temperature is large? No, it's it's probably um opening and closing the door. And no, it's what not happens very bad. in the section that it freeze makes a cube? That's where it's freezing up to, all together, or it's in, in no, the tray. No, it's in the bin. It's no, I mean, it's in the in the, in the tray. You're in the tray. Oh, and it's melted. Yeah, yeah, it's stuck together. You know, oh. it's stuck together. I guess. Well, it melted and then stuck okay, together yeah, because yeah, they yeah. were fused. Well, it gets um, a little moisture when it melts. You just said something. I did that check. That's, these are the four things you check, right? Obvious things which nobody checks. The gasket around that general area. So you can see them properly. Yep. Because you may have a little bit of air infiltration that gets right onto the ice. So if I am, I don't know if I should tell you because I, how to do Because normally we will take, if it doesn't seal properly, all right? And sometimes it's kind of wavy. We take a hair dryer and hold it about this distance and just gently, you know, that swab it in. That's a critical process. Go, yes, go very slow and warm up the gasket and it's gonna, the magnet will dry it in and lift it off and seal it properly. But if you do it too long. And but do not hold it, if you try it in one position, move it, you know? The last guy I told you you need to move it, he hold it together, I don't know. You hold it one piece. I don't know. Maybe I was talking with a different accent or something. No. But, you know, my accent can be a working. So, um, float 
valve, fourth fluid valve, always check, make sure, even if this is a solenoid fill valve. What we normally do, if we suspect that water is coming into the evap, into the amp sump while the machine is running, we shut down the machine and open up the water fill section and just stand up there and see if any water is running in. Maybe it's yeah. maybe, maybe the solenoid is not seating because yeah. remember I told you some of this water has a ton of crap. Yeah. So that crap will get into the seat of the arm. Wow, right. Well, wow. and you see, you see the tip of that pen? <coughs> that solenoid valve where the plunger comes down, there's a little hole in a rubber diaphragm, the size of the tip of that pen. If that gets blocked up, your valve ain't going, going to close properly because it depends on pressure equalization to close that valve. So if that little hole is blocked, the, the water <coughs> equalization above and below the um, diaphragm. So it's not going to close. It's going to be, I'm going to call it weaving through. All right? And it may not seem like much if you're looking at a couple drops, but over a period of 20 minutes, it's enough to keep the float way up where it shouldn't be. And it's not going to initiate. Stop your batch. Yeah, it's not going to initiate your harvest when it needs to. So, one of the things, a couple of things you will actually find in real life, and I see this every time sometimes, right? Who wear circulation or run a condenser? People always put their ice maker up in that corner and then they pack boxes with paper plates, paper cups, and what have you around that ice machine. Now, they will call you with a problem because the ice maker who is circulation, guess what's going to happen? High head pressure, right? Yeah. High head pressure, what's going to happen? You're going to get a high suction pressure. No, just what's going to happen if you have excessively high head pressure? It's going to trip on the... Good, it's going to trip, right? And here's the thing. That's a manually resettable safety, right? Uh -huh. So they're going to call you because the ice maker is making ice. But they know you come and say they move everything from around the machine so yeah. you can have space. So you don't know what that they're packing stuff up around there. So you, so you gotta go like, reset, check everything, and God, I'm going crazy, but I can't find anything wrong with your ice machine. And when you leave, the when you leave the pack, stop. Oh, the ice maker stop working again. You just fix it. You don't know what the hell you're doing. And so one guy found this out, and guess how he found it out? He forgot his. He forgot his tool there, the, the, his temperature amp, his amp yeah. huh. And he turned around because he was a distance away, you know. He turned around, he came back, and there it was, all the boxes around the thing. But the boxes weren't there. And while he was there, the damn machine tripped. While he was standing there? Yes, the yeah, machine tripped again. Because same they, problem. They're packing so, the boxes up. You know. Well, at least he Figured it out. Yep. By driving back. So, um, the condenser, it may not, you know, for an ice maker, like maybe in a store, you can be looking and looking and looking. That condenser never looks dirty. But it's, it's pulling in all these tiny particles of dust and um, lint and what have you. The same kind of lint you find in your clothes dryer. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's what's going through these fins. And it, you're looking and, you know, there's no outward indication that your condenser coil is restricting the airflow or any, any visual uh, sign that says, hey, I'm, I'm being um, blocked up here. I need to be clean. But it does go off. And normally, even the, the condenser brush or anything will not take out this because it's kind of <coughs> already sucked right into the middle part of this condenser section. We normally, uh, many times I went to a job where I had to 
I don't have an air compressor in my truck, but I have nitrogen tanks. Mm -hmm. And I, I made up a blower just for this. A blower hose, you want the regular blower tip you find in a mechanic shop. Yeah. And blow this out. While the boss or whosoever owns the place is still there. Sometimes you drive the customers out to the building. That's so bad. Yes. When you come out of there, you got to take the nitrogen and blow yourself off. Are you blowing it off from from the outside, the opposite direction of the air? Always the opposite oh, direction. Right. Didn't make it sure. Because uh, most of the time, it pulls in towards the fan. The fan is behind here, and it pulls this way. So if you have space, you can take off the fan blade, and you have enough space to blow. If not, you know. Always, we always fabricate something that would fit in those little fancy yeah. convenient no, like the, There was just a guy, I just bought a, a nice uh, air compressor for 30 bucks. Whoa. From some kid. Yeah. And yeah. I went to the store and it was 200 in the store. You want to sell that beer for $40? Uh, there was, there was, he had three of them. He's got three of them. Next How many I gallons? Him, I asked him. Six gallons. It's a little perfect for that. All right. Tank it, compress it, two outlets. So that's another cause of um, high head pressure. Remember I told you what happens with these fan motor because they have the pressure control to, make, to cycle on and off. The fan cycle it control. Work twice as hard. It works yeah, right as hard. Energy. And they do go bad more often than the regular condenser motors. It's a fact that we have to live with. And for some reason, only, only Manitoba ice made their system like this. Because the Saki does not have the <laughs> cycle on and off system. Why do they sound like they're all Japanese? Uh, Jose Saki is Japanese. Manitoba was made in uh, Wisconsin. The same company that makes that ice machine used to make submarines for the U.S. in World War I and II. They use Manitoba cranes, you see them around? Uh, I think I have. Yeah, they make some of the biggest cranes in the world. Well, they all went to that, like, you know, they like Hyundai makes ships and everything. Oh, they make everything. Construction they, equipment uh, and... Yeah, Hyundai makes everything. Yeah. And it, even the money. Oh, <laughs> money. That's the part I want to make, money. They make the money. You know? Now, if you have a new system, there is no way we can suffer from system overcharge. And um, that's one because too much again, too much of refrigerant, high head pressure, high suction pressure. But if it's new, you can cross If it's that new, also. you can cross that out. But the thing is, um, if you're out there in the field and you're this comes with, with people who really charge top off an ice machine system while it's in the um, ice making you said stage, right? The, harvest. the best way to find out if you have the proper charge with most all ice machine anyhow is put it into a harvest yeah. and check your temperatures and pressure. Or check your temperatures anyhow. Your low side pressure for whatever gas it is, but the low side and temperature should always be above 32 degrees. Because if it's not above 32 degrees, it's not going to harvest the ice. And you can top the system off from there. When the system comes up to above 32 degrees, close, yeah. it, close off everything, pack up, and you can safely go home. Take it from me. Well, you guys know what non condensable uh, yeah. does in a system, right? Mm -hmm. yes. That's if you don't evacuate. If, you don't if you're in a hurry, yeah. like some of the guys who just left, all right, they're going to have a ton of non condensable in the system. They're going to get called back one, once a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. But non condensable is moisture in the system. And that's caused by not evacuating or if you have a low side leak and this system ever went into a low side vacuum yeah. because it leaked out most of the refrigerant unless it, it didn't have any um, 
low pressure protection and the low side went into a vacuum, it will pull in air. And that air goes into the high side. And I may be at, like, let's say, a negative or 10 inches vacuum. My head pressure may be showing, let's say, 150 PSI for 404. Hey, that's 150 PSI I really don't want. It's not refrigerant PSI, it's non condensable. Uh -huh. So now if I go top the system off without doing anything. Yeah, too much pressure. I have that 150 plus whatever it is for the 404 relative to ambient. Plus the moisture. And let's say it's 90. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say it's 95 degrees plus 20 degrees. That would make our 404 somewhere in the region of 250 PSI. Yeah. That plus 150 right away is 400. Mm -hmm. My machine shuts down and high head pressure. For just for wanting not doing the right damn thing in the first place. Look at your leak, guys. Fix it. Evacuate. Leak test. Evacuate. Weigh in the right amount. If you don't have a scale, then hey, do it like I told you. Temperature. Temperature. Temperatures works. You know. And um, the last, the last moment to top the system off always. Check your harvest temperatures and pressures, and you know if they're within limits. If What's the limits above freezing to what? Within ten degrees. So thirty-two to forty-two degrees. Within yes, that. which is normally where they operate. Okay. And hot days that may go up, like we have a hundred degree day that will go up a little. But typically these things are indoor, and that would normally be a. Um, there because remember it's going to start low because there's ice there mm -hmm. and then it's going to increase so by the time the ice comes off of that evaporator that, that temperature should be reading or somewhere it's around 30 to 40 degrees typically okay. and you know across the board if you go with that you, go wrong. you can go wrong and, and as much as um, I tell you guys that this is commercial, you really don't have that much of a fudge room. That's not, you know, you don't have, a, that's not playing the system. You still have to be, like, accurate. But that's the best way if you have limited tools at your fingertips right at that moment. You know, those are some things. Um, I mean, that's what I'm telling you there is probably not going to be in any book. Oh, well, that's important stuff. But just try to remember that and it's going well, to get that, you up some that's nasty knowledge, situation. That's knowledge you've got from the field, right? Yeah. That's knowledge from doing Same it. Same as when field. I tell you how to charge a line set, if you had to cut it. Mm -hmm. Right. How to charge a line set for wind and summer without having to weigh in a charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you follow that simple rule and, I mean, it's not a rule, but it's a rule. You do it. It works. <coughs> it works. You haven't had a problem with it. All right, uh, we have about five minutes more. Okay, let's go to the low side and then we're going to call it quits for today, hopefully. And um, Rob, before you go. Yes. Remember I told you guys about that glycol thing? Yeah, yeah. we looked at it. You saw it this morning? Yeah. No. You saw it yesterday afternoon. afternoon. Yeah, but I put it up now. I have to get some glycol to mix with the water so it doesn't freeze. Mm -hmm. And I put one of those condenser coil right there on the shelving. Yes. But I need a piece of hose now to tie in the two. So the guys are going to do it this evening. Okay. And um, you guys will see it in operation. Okay. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we had our freezer operating yesterday. Yeah. Got down to 18 degrees and then we had to shut it down.